Hi everybody, welcome. Hope you have had a great lunch and that you're feeling energized for the afternoon. Woo! <laughs> um, welcome to track two. I'm Tess from WordPress VIP at Automatic and I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. Ben Thompson is the founder and author of Stratechery, a blog about technology and strategy, woo, and the impact of the internet on media. He's here to share the story of Stratechery and something a bit new called Passport. In his talk, expanding WordPress's capabilities to support personalized content creation at scale. Over to you, Ben. I haven't given, whoa, that's very loud. Um, uh, number one, welcome to Taiwan. Uh, I have lived in Taiwan for a long time, which I'm actually gonna get to in my story. Today is very reluctantly, but I feel appropriately, going to be mostly about me. Um, I actually got this shirt, which has a Shrekery logo on it. I had to tear the tag off the shirt when I got it because I sold merch once and I was so mortified at the sort of like self-promotion involved and all that sort of thing that I, I, got, I just bought a bunch and put them down in the bottom of my closet, never wore it. And I like to talk about tech. I like to talk about the impact of the internet, but I don't really like to talk about myself. But the story for me and the story for Shatekri is very intertwined with WordPress. And that's one of the reasons I was happy to come here to speak. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to sort of give this talk to everyone in this room and in part just express my gratitude for everything everyone here does. I grew up in a small town called Lodi, uh, Lodi, Wisconsin, not Lodi, California. Uh, Lodi, Wisconsin, it's about 30 miles north of Madison. Uh, if you see the, the sort of crosswalk there and the stop, that is the main intersection in town, uh, as in there is not a stoplight. Uh, there, it, it, it is a, you know, I grew up a great childhood. I have no sort of real complaints, but I was in a sort of world that we knew San Francisco existed. We knew New York existed. Maybe some people in town had been to Chicago, but really no sort of awareness or acknowledgement or impact of sort of the rest of the world or, or business or technology. This is in the 90s, the internet was taking off, and I was so intrigued by this. This idea that you could go, you could learn anything. I was the first person that I knew to sort of get online, thanks to a, a cousin when I visited him in California, like this is incredible. It's the first person I knew to get an email address. But this interest wasn't really matched by any sort of like career aspirations. That, there was no one in my life that did anything like that. No one, you know, went off to college. Like, for me, like the, the big aspirational thing, if you were sort of smart and you could really pull it off, was to go to the University of Wisconsin, which is, which is what I did. And there, you know, was super into it. Like, uh, dot com was exploding. I stayed in the dorms two years. Most people stay one year because the dorm had a T1 connection, which was amazing. Um, Napster came out when I was a freshman in, in, in college and like just very, very exciting, very into it. But it's interesting looking back like where my mind was. What I should have done is I should have packed up and gone to San Francisco and worked in tech and seen what happened. But it just never occurred to me. I was gonna, maybe like the aspirational goal that, that occurred to me was maybe I would go become a professor or do something like that. My last year, or my last few years of college, I worked for one of the student newspapers called the Badger Herald. Uh, I couldn't find any appropriate pictures. I had to take a Google Maps picture of the building that it was in. It was up on the third floor at the four lease. Um, that is another story about the impact of the internet on media that we're not necessarily going to get into. But one of the things I did at, at the Badger Herald when I was there, I was in charge of the editorial page my senior year. And you know, to, there had been like, there's like opinion columns and things like that. That's how I got started. I wrote an opinion column. But occasionally every month, every two months, people would, you know, the, the, the editorial board, such as it existed, would write some pompous sort of essay about world events that absolutely no one cared about. It was really just, you know, play acting at being an editorial board. And I thought, like, what if we could actually 
make an impact? What if we could actually influence things? What that meant was we had to focus on what we could actually control. Or not control, but at least influence. So there was really three things. It was student government, it was like the university administration, and city government. And maybe state government was in the right city, but that was even getting a little big. And so we set five goals. There's five things we want to change. This varied from things like this sort of attitude towards like free speech on campus, uh, drinking laws, like certain legislations that was in front of the city council. Like, so very practical things to some philosophical things and sort of a mix. And what we did is we wrote an editorial every single day. Uh, well, four days a week, and the fifth day was for letters of the editor. Four days, we would write an editorial every single day about one of those five topics. Now, this was kind of a crazy goal I'd never been done before. The reality was the editorial board was theoretically authoring these. I actually authored like 85% of them. And it turned out, number one, uh, I love to write. That idea of writing every day was very invigorating. And number three, it had an impact. Like of our five goals, we marked sort of at the end of the year significant progress in four of them. The fifth was about the state government. Like I said, they didn't listen to us. So we were already reaching a little too high right there. And this was like, this gave me like, this is what I want to do. I want to do this sort of, I want to do this sort of writing. I want to have an impact in this way. But like, how do I actually do that? Because I looked up, uh, you know, so the, the, I went to the New York Times editorial page because as a political science major, of course, I had to have my New York Times subscription. I looked at the bios of everyone on there. Most of them like journalists for 20 years, journalists for 25 years, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, I don't want to be a journalist. I don't want to do that for a long time. I don't want to wait till I'm 50 and sort of get there. And then there was William Sapphire. I don't know if you, any of you old people remember William Sapphire. He was the, you know, the, the, the Times has to always have their conservative columnist. He was their conservative columnist for a long time. But the reason he was interested to, interesting to me is he had worked as a political operative. He worked in like the Nixon White House and you know, worked up through there. And then he, he moved over to, to, to uh, writing. And I'm like, that sounds much more interesting. I'm going to work in politics, I studied political science, and then I will just step into a job at the New York Times. Um, probably a little ambitious <laughs> in retrospect. So I left, I went to work on a political campaign, and I realized that politics is terrible. It's it, I not recommend it at all. I worked there for a few months, and then I'm like, like, it made my skin crawl. I was working on a campaign, and I just sort of bailed out. And so I'm sitting, I'm sitting in uh, uh, the, um, but in the meantime, like, I still wanted to write. Well, so I started a blog in 2002 when I graduated on Blogger. And then when I graduated, sort of a year later, of course my blog had been not maintained. Uh, a year later, I'm like, I need to start a blog again. So what software should I use? Turned out, a couple, like a month or two right before I did this, this new hot new thing had launched WordPress. I don't think that's what it looked like in 2003. That was as far back as I get on the Wayback Machine. Um, but so I started a WordPress blog. And I started a WordPress blog I thought to sort of articulating my views of the world, of course, everyone's going to be so interested. But actually, I, was, I didn't know what to do with my life. And I was working at the Center for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, like teletyping their calls. Of course, I was still the pretentious political science graduate, so I had my New York Times subscription. And I was reading an article about a bombing in Saudi Arabia. And they interviewed an English teacher there. And I'm like, oh, I could be an English teacher. That doesn't sound so bad. Uh, <laughs> it turned out I didn't want to go to Saudi Arabia. Kind of wanted to go to Japan. I missed the deadline to apply for their English teaching program. The government won by a day. And a friend's like, oh, I just got back from Taiwan. Or my brother just got back from Taiwan. He, he thinks it's great. It's fantastic. Talk to him. He's like, yeah, I'll hook you up. I'll connect you with people. And so my blog mostly became documenting my time in Taiwan. And that's what I was doing. I was teaching Kindergartners are ABCs. In retrospect, it would be impossible to sort of do the things that I do today without this sort of bit. I just articulated all these goals, all these ideas that I had, all the things I wanted to do that were completely unrealistic and out of touch. I, I, I was, you know, I'm going to just step into the New York Times. I'm going to go become a professor. I'm going to do sort of X, Y, Z. And I literally couldn't come up with anything better to do in the meantime than teach English. But it turned out teaching English was pretty great. You had actual tangible impact on kids' lives and on sort of their outcomes. 
and I had to sort of accept, look, if that's all that happens, that's okay. It's okay. Just be a good person, work hard, change someone's life, even if it's only one or two, and everything's gonna be fine. Anyhow, not to dwell too long on my English teaching, the question is, how was I teaching the ABCs and end up in the same country, but in a very different sort of role, standing here on stage at sort of WordCamp 2024 with a full crowd, everyone, you know, very excited to come, which I, I appreciate in my own branded shirt that I'm very embarrassed about wearing. I went through, you know, th th here I owe my wife a lot. She was like, all you do when you come home is read about and talk about tech. Like, why did you not go work in tech? <laughs> and I'm like, it honestly never occurred to me. That wasn't something people who grew up like me did. And so I'm like, well, I'm gonna sort of, you know, what's the fastest, shortest route to legitimacy in the US job market? Kind of researched a little bit. Oh, I have to get an MBA. Now I'd grown up on the web, in the tech web, and MBAs were the worst. And having gotten an MBA, most of it's true, to be totally honest. But I went back to the US, I got an MBA, I had the opportunity to intern at Apple, and then I went to Microsoft uh, after I graduated, and I had a couple friends from sort of business school that were like, you have so many opinions and so many takes about tech, and they're, they're good, they're interesting, you need to start a blog. I'm like, I've started so many blogs. <laughs> they, they, I, I'm like, I'm not, am I really gonna do another one? But you know, there was other things going on. My wife was from Taiwan. We kind of wanted to come back, and it's, it's like, well, this is what I want to do. And then something, you know, I saw all my compatriots from when I graduated. I graduated at the same time as like uh, Ezra Klein or Matthew Iglesias, two people in, in, in politics that are my age. John Gruber had started Daring Fireball about Apple in, in 2003, about when I graduated. And I'm like, man, I could have been doing that, but I let my blog die. But I realized, well. One problem with blogging back then is, you know, there's the ads, the ad model is not going to work in the long run. And like that, like my analytical mind says that's going to be an issue, but a new company had come along called Stripe that made sort of subscriptions possible. And I'm like, I think there might be a model to sort of help people, you know, to massively increase your average revenue per, per user and actually build something so I could be in Taiwan in a long time. So what did I do? I went to wordpress.org, or actually, I, went, I think I went to, to, to uh, uh, I was smarter this time, I went to a managed host. Um, and I started a blog. I was still at Microsoft, but I launched this blog called Stratechery. Stratechery, strategy and tech. You know, in the long run, it would be a site that would grow via word of mouth with a name that nobody could pronounce, um, which is not, 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 not an approach I necessarily endorse. But the fact that I could do this on my own that the, it was available, there was a host available. This is an adaptation of some open source theme that I sort of found online. There's a bunch of different plugins that it went to, making it all sort of work. I could be this sort of dreamer from a small town that had managed to worm his way up into a big tech company. And I could start a, start a site that was mine and do, do what I want, do, write what I wanted to write. I did feel there was this space between like product sites and Wall Street, like all the stuff in the middle about strategy and culture and incentives and business models and all that sort of thing. So I thought there was an opportunity, thought it'd take like five years and I really needed a job <laughs> because the problem was Microsoft lets you blog, but then I couldn't blog about Microsoft. And also it just felt a little weird because I was kind of critical of Microsoft. I was really, uh, thought Apple was doing a great job at this time. And so I needed a job that let me blog. And I have to thank some of the people in this room. This is actually not my first WordPress or my first WordCamp. The last time I was at a WordCamp was at WordCamp Indonesia. And there is one of my automatic t-shirts. I had a chance to come work for automatic. And at Automatic, it was, uh, it was actually kind of funny because I was on the team that eventually shifted to doing Project Gutenberg. I was not an engineer, so I had literally nothing to do. Um, so I kind of wrote a lot of strategy, um, so I appreciate the forbearance as I was uh, uh, figuring out what to do next. 
a few months later, thanks to the internet, it took off. It just exploded uh, really, really quickly. Twitter, Facebook, all the social media was actually a huge advantage if you were a small player, if you didn't have huge costs to sort of worry about. And you fast forward, it just not very long, eight or nine months, and number one, I felt really guilty because I wasn't doing enough work at Automatic. Uh, but number two, I felt like I had an audience and I could actually do this. I left and the WordPress ecosystem really came to my aid once again. I was able to build up a subscription model for my site. And this was before you have all the software that's out there today. It was like there, there, I had to glue together a lot of different pieces, but I could manage gluing. I couldn't manage actually making all this stuff. And the fact that there were so many tools and options and plugins and themes made it possible that, you know, a year later, Strecker 2.0, now you have subscriptions. And it, if you like what I write, I'm going to give you more, sort of, if you subscribe. Fast forward to today, you know, Strecker has been running for a decade. There's a whole host of family, there's a host of products, a bunch of podcasts. I have a chance to do interviews with amazing people. I've, I've had Matt on before. I've had other tech CEOs like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Sachin Nadella. I've interviewed lots of startup founders, analysts. And then to know that people sort of all, all over the world are reading and consuming this and it has a big impact and turned out to be a lot more financially lucrative than I thought it would be, full disclosure. All of this is, it's, I look back and None of this was anything that I imagined. It was just absolutely incredible. Like I said, millions of readers, hundreds of thousands of subscribers, tens of thousands of members, to have a real impact, to know that things happen in Silicon Valley or things happen in, in Washington, D.C. Or, or on Wall Street or whatever. And all of this, sure, I worked hard. But people talk about, oh, you know, the, 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 the bit of luck. I would say my biggest bit of luck is the fact that the product you guys all work on and the ecosystem that was built by all the people in this room made all of that possible. And so I want to thank all of you. Anyhow, one of the big theories that I write about is one of the, 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 the big themes of Techery is this thing called aggregation theory. There is this idea that before if I wanted to be sort of William Sapphire or whatever it might be, I had to get a job with a newspaper. Why? Because you have to actually get the product in front of people. And you need printing presses, and you need an advertising ecosystem, and you need like classifieds, and you need delivery trucks, you need all these sorts of things. And that gave a lot of power to anyone that controlled the sort of distribution. How do you actually get stuff in front of people? The internet completely transforms this. WordPress has played a part of this, but just the idea that everyone has free distribution. Everyone can distribute. The, the problem with that, and this goes to my bit before about advertising going to zero, there's infinite content. If literally anyone can do it, you're going to get, everyone's going to do it. And you're going to get tons and tons of stuff. And the issue is, number one, that's not very good for the people who used to have exclusive control. And number two, how do you find what you're looking for? Like, there's just so much stuff out there. What happens is there are companies that come along and they are what I call aggregators. They get all the content and they help you discover it. Google is obviously the classic example. You go to Google to find something that you're looking for. And when, what does Google do? Does Google deliver you to a website? No, Google delivers you to a page. They deliver you to a post. Like, it it's completely atomizes and commoditizes all this content. And if everyone starts at Google and Google knows everything that you get, well, if you're an advertiser, where are you going to go? Are you going to go to all those other sites and maybe by randomly get the right person? No, you're going to go to Google, right? And you could have a, a similar thing with sort of Facebook. You, like, you go to Facebook, and Facebook is total commoditization. You have a six-month investigative report from the New York Times is a little box on there. And then you have a picture of your niece with their new dog. <laughs> and it's like literally the same size. It's total commodification of content. And the big challenge for publishers is if you're stuck in that, if you're behind the aggregator, if you're behind Google, you're behind Facebook, you're in big trouble. Your only answer is just churn out more, churn out more. What happens if you churn out more? The quality goes down, quality goes down. People aren't particularly interested. And you end up just scrounging around for pennies and getting all the crap that's on the internet today. So what part, you know, what the brilliance or, or the, the appropriate response for a publisher 
is you have to connect directly with customers. You have to go around the aggregator. You have to build a direct connection. And that is what trajectory was. And that's what you know, newspapers have succeeded, like the New York Times, has succeeded by building direct connections with customers. And again, tools, software were available to help me do that. Obviously, more have come along since then. Many of them sort of modeled on trajectory. And that's a great thing. But I wanted it to be a little bit better. One of the challenges, and I go back to that post of WordPress started in 2003, the only means, it was amazing that any person could start a blog, but the functionality was you wrote a post and you broadcast it to everyone. Everyone got the same thing. And so I would write about in the context of this, oh, if you want to succeed on the internet, you have to build a direct connection with customers. But the direct connection with customers wasn't actually a direct connection. It was just a much smaller broadcast. And so what, as I was thinking about this, how can I make trajectory better? What is sort of missing? What's the missing hole? How can I build a direct connection with customers that actually sort of realizes is like the second piece to this idea of, yes, anyone can write, but how can you actually build sort of a direct connection? This is what led to over the last three years, I've been working, or three to four years, I've been working on this new piece of software called Passport. Passport is what powers trajectory right now in addition to WordPress. WordPress does all the WordPress sort of stuff. What sort of uh, Passport does is all the things about connecting with my customers. So number one, there are five free channels. We all think about the web, but by free I mean sort of, uh, uh, not free as in beer, free as in speech. You have access to the web, you have access to RSS, you have access to podcasts, which is basically RSS, but we're going to call it a different thing. You have access to email, and you have access to messaging. Now, messaging is a great example of it costs money, but you can send a message to sort of any sort of phone number. The first thing Passport does is it makes sure you can communicate with all, all your customers via those five free channels. So you don't have to go and get an integration here, an integration there, and make sure stuff glues together and moves around. It's all part of one thing. You should be able to have a post, have some content, and distribute it in whatever way sort of makes sense, and be able to meet your customers sort of wherever you are. The second thing is you want to deliver that sort of tokens and sort of customized experience. What do I mean by tokens? Well, you're sending out all, uh, this, came, this idea came, I first built the sort of podcast piece of this. It was actually the, 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 a different product that, that sort of evolved into what, what it is now. The way you do paid podcasts, is it's security by obfuscation, right? You, you give everyone a unique R URL. And so everyone has a unique URL that they add to their podcast player and they can get sort of the podcast that they paid for. It sort of occurred to me, if every single person has a unique URL, why should every single person get the exact same content? You should be able to, just as a basic sort of thing, if you go in your podcast, it has your subscription information. If, you're, if, you're, if your subscription is expired, you can let them know via podcast. If you have other podcasts, like say I have Sharp Tech, I have Dithering, you should be able to put a link in there. You click that link and you can immediately download the podcast without having to search in iTunes or go back to the website, all these sorts of things. We can do this because Passport tokenizes everything. Everything is unique to that customer that they get. If you get an email from me, every link that goes back to my site, you click that link, you get to read it right there. You don't have to log in. Why? I know it's you. I sent that email unique to you. Every link is tokenized. You click that link, you're logged in right away or via a podcast sort of thing. And this is something that we're just, we've barely scratched the surface of, but to me is opens up this entirely new sort of opportunity for having content that one person can create for anyone, but then can sort of customize it and deliver it to all their users and have much more of that sort of direct connection. All this functions through something called sort of entitlements. Entitlements is just basically this idea, go think about a passport. This is the name where it came from. You have a passport, that says who you are. How do you actually get into a country? You need a visa, right? You, you need sort of the, the permission that yes, this person has access to this particular piece of territory. This is how Passport sort of functions. Every user, instead of putting them in buckets and say, okay, we have content, bucket A, bucket B, bucket C, okay, can they pass the paywall and come in? We start with the user. This user has access to these different entitlements. This user has an entitlement to this sort of content. This user's entitlement to that sort of content. This user, because it's all based on OAuth, 
can integrate with anything else. So I'm integrated with Spotify. You link your Spotify and your Passport account together. You have an entitlement to the Spotify content. You go to Spotify, you can listen to my 4 pay podcast sort of for free. This sort of flipping it on its head from being content first to user first, and users have sort of visas where they can go, enables, again, in the, we, we, we just built a little bit, but in the long run, this idea that you could sort of connect to all sorts of services, you can deliver all sorts of content, that again, is unique and special to the user, and is something that a single sort of a small team or a single person can do without needing massive infrastructure and connections and all these sorts of things. You can make arbitrary plans. I do things like corporate plans, like the Microsoft plan or whatever sort of X, Y, Z. All this is super seamless. They just get the Microsoft entitlement. That is what they sort of are, are entitled to. All these sort of pieces go together. Membership management, distribution, sort of a paywall, single sign-on, Stripe payments built for WordPress. And the goal is I wanted to deliver a great experience to my customers that is personal to them, that lets them feel like they're connected with Stratechery. It's just not getting access to a blog with annoying paywall. It's something that is unique to me and it's something that can grow and have more opportunities sort of going forward. What's particularly exciting is, like I said, I personally feel like this was sort of a bit of a hole. I think it was a hole in content management generally and I feel like it was a bit of a hole for the WordPress ecosystem specifically. So I'm super excited to announce that I am uh, actually partnering full circle, coming back with Automatic to make Passport sort of broadly available. It's not available today. It will be available in the coming weeks. Uh, if the goal is to have it today, but we didn't make it. You guys have all made software before. Uh, it is coming soon. As a part of this, this is a commitment from me. There, there is absolutely gonna be an open source project. It's not open source yet. That is part of sort of the process of getting it there. But why do this? It's, I've talked about the product parts, but a big part of this is this ecosystem, this product has given so much to me and it means a lot to me to be able to give back. There's a philosophical sort of point, which is people should be able to control their own destiny on the internet. You shouldn't be able to be canceled or taken off sort of X, Y, Z. I'm not gonna get canceled. Like I write about tech strategy. I don't think anyone particularly cares about me. But there is a point where one of my providers got pretty aggressive in taking people off their, off their platform you know, four or five years ago. And it's like, do I actually wanna be associated with or even potentially subject to folks that are where it's not in my control. If someone kicks me off my email provider, what can I do? The, the only way you can be truly publisher friendly, you can truly support independent publishers, is through open source, is through the entire ethos that sort of fills this room. And that is something that I absolutely sort of want to deliver. You can find out more, you can sign up and get information. Again, a very basic sort of marketing page at passport.online, but the reason I wanted to sort of talk about it today and introduce it here is people ask me a lot, all the time, like, oh, you, I mean, I haven't taken, you know, why are you, why are you, I've built this myself. I spent, spent the money, I mean, with engineers, obviously, but this isn't sort of a VC sort of project. And I'm like, you can't understand my motivations here without understanding the philosophy that I believe in that is very much the WordPress philosophy and the extent to which I appreciate what was made possible for me and what I hope I can make possible for sort of other people down the road. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, we have some time for questions. I bet there is at least one question. Down here in the front, we've got a microphone coming. Hello, hello. Uh, hi, Ben, thank you very much. Uh, great speech and uh, I'm really impressed by everything that you, you did in this, this journey. Uh, I'm curious then of what is the business model for Passport. You're saying that it will be open source, but does it also mean that we can like switch the providers, like we can switch the Stripe uh, payment or like the yeah. SMS so published So Passport from the very uh, basic is meant to be publisher friendly. Now there's lots of subscription providers that talk about being publisher friendly. And I think they are very sincere. My view is you cannot be truly publisher friendly unless you have an open source alternative. Because that means the publisher actually has sort of total control. Now that said, Passport is pretty complicated software. 
uh, one of the challenges is with the sort of blog, you think about the traditional WordPress. What was always the WordPress challenge when you installed WordPress, right? You need WP Cache, right? Or <laughs> else so you're, you're going to be in trouble. That's pretty easy, though, when you're just publishing one thing for everyone. To actually deliver on an individual basis is pretty tough. And so as part of making it available open source, I did want to have a hosted sort of uh, version available because I think that's going to be the most approachable and useful option for most people. So I'm very pleased and excited to have the opportunity to partner with Automatic to sort of make, uh, make that available. But uh, the business model, from my perspective, I didn't raise VC. I'm not out here to make a $400 million company or whatever the, the return would need to be for whatever it does. This is why I, I did it myself. Because when you do it yourself, you have more latitude, you have more room, you have the ability to be somewhat philosophical about it. And so yes, certainly I would, would like to make some money. There will be a, uh, some combination of monthly fee and a relatively small sort of revenue share that, that makes this possible. But, uh, but I'm not looking for an astronomical return, again, I started Checkery to not make very much money either. Maybe it ends up being huge. That would be amazing. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> but uh, but th there will be fees that are associated with it. But the you know hopefully by not having the necessity of a particular guaranteed return, we can sort of grow it slowly and organically and, and make it broadly accessible. Yeah, thank you. More questions? Yep, there's one just here. Hi, Ben. Thank you. Uh, finally, good to see you after eight years. Uh, I'm a big fan of your content and everything you do. Um, uh, not a question to Passport, just uh, intrigued if you're hiring. Intrigued what? Hiring. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are welcome to email me and make the pitch. Uh, <laughs> so here's the deal. Do we need uh, more work? Absolutely, we could definitely use more help. I think the issue right now is this is part of sort of the philosophical issue. It's really important to us to sort of keep costs under control, but we are, you know, TBD, TBD. I would say email me, um, but there's definitely no guarantees with that, but you, we're gonna just see how it goes. I already did, but thanks for that. No, okay. <laughs> Reference this talk, sorry, I get a lot of email. I give a whole bit about philosophy of life and how you uh, survive. One of them is you have someone else mostly check your email, so I'm going to blame him. Uh, but yeah. Just stick up your hand if you have a question. Down here in the front. Hi, Ben. I think a lot about my information diet. I think a lot about inputs and outputs, uh, creative outputs being writing, for example, and inputs being some of the content I might consume through Passport, like a podcast. You have a lot of output. You're creating a software startup, you write a lot, you podcast a lot. What are some of your inputs? Uh, I mean, uh, it, <laughs> it's a good question. I am, and you could probably pick this up going back to the history that I told you about, you hear about sort of information, sort of omnivores or information or, or whatever the word sort of is. That's been me from a very young age. There's pretty much no moment of time other than I'm like sort of with my family that I'm not reading or sort of consuming. Now, it, is it, you know, I think the, you know, the internet's been amazing in this regard. I think that Twitter for all its sort of flaws and challenges over the last year remains an incredible place to find sort of new things. I think the, the internet, one of the glorious sort of outcomes of the internet, as far as social networking goes, is sort of chat and group chat. And I've had the good opportunity. I, mean, I started out just a total outsider, some guy in Taiwan writing a blog, right? And it was thanks to social media that it grew and people shared and things on those lines. Now I have the chance to sort of know a lot more people, which is, which is pretty cool, and you learn stuff sort of that way. But I would say just, uh, it's, always, it's a question I always get. And it's a, it, for me, I try to think of things from the sort of base assumptions as much as possible. And I view a lot of my information consumption as one, it's sort of like scavenging, like trying to figure out everything that's going on. And then when there's something I want to focus on, that's when I drill deep. So people ask, well, what books do you read? I personally am not a person that just sits down for fun and reads a book by and large, unless I'm on vacation, I'm reading some junky, like sort of like, like uh, for, for, you know, fiction novel. But sometimes I will read a book in a very, I'm a very fast reader, just because I want to know about this topic and I know I need to understand deeply sort of the history. I think some of the best trajectory posts are like that. They get into some of the historical context of things like that. So I'd say I'm very, 
it's sort of a scavenge and then focus and dig super deep. That's sort of the approach that I take. I'm not, it's hard to articulate it. I'm not sure how replicable it is, but it works for me. And it's one of those things I've been honing for literally like 35 years because <laughs> that's just how I've always sort of operated. Yep, there's another one just here. Hey, Ben. So how do you determine the balance or the equilibrium between your philosophy and revenue? Well, the, 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 this is both a good thing and a bad thing, that I have a full-time job, uh, which is writing trajectory. So uh, the, the goal, uh, now I'm not a believer in, I think there is a challenge when stuff is purely altruistic. That can have its own bad incentive sort of as well. So Passport is definitely going to have a business model. We're going to hopefully sort of make money. But at the same time, you know, I thought about this idea of this ecosystem for years and years, as you can imagine, right? Like I, I was the one that the first one to go through the pain of trying to build a subscription management system when none of it sort of really existed. There were, it, and again, thank you to the ecosystem. There were some good plugins that were there, mostly designed to gate content like downloads and things like that. that I was able to adapt for a sort of a, a daily sort of communication sort of thing. But so I knew there was a need. My question all along, just to be totally frank, was I wasn't sure how large the market was going to be. And I was concerned about, as with my publisher hat, if you have someone offering the software who at the end of the day needs to make a certain size return, at what point do the incentives of the software provider diverge from the incentives of the publisher? And so to me, this is the positive of Stratechery is by and large, or has completely funded the development of Passport to date, is that that allows Passport to be first and foremost thinking about the publisher and what makes sense for them. Now, I'm not going to promise or guarantee how that's going to turn out in the long run. Maybe this is something that I think the software is actually exceptionally capable. I'm more philosophical, then. I'm more curious about how important that aspect determines your approach. Oh, extremely philosophical. This is fairly insane financially, to be clear. <laughs> I mean, uh, again, I'm fortunate things to check where I can afford it, but the really the driving thing was not just the need for the software, but the real sense, particularly four to five years ago, that publishers and the WordPress ecosystem needs a, an alternative that is for people that, you know, you, you go back to when WordPress started. I won't speak for, for Matt or whatever, but this sort of idea that like, there was various contexts, all content should be free, right? Everything on the internet is sort of free. I was very sort of, uh, I didn't believe that when I started Chitechery, and I would get in sort of like, you know, arguments about it that no, I think that the definition of free can differ. For, you know, free as in beer is not necessarily a requirement. Free as in sort of speech is. And that's sort of the core thing that is undergirding the motivation. Uh, that I want people to have expensive beer, but be able to sell whatever beer they want. We've got time for a couple more questions, if there are any. Yes, just behind you here. Can you, yeah. More ad hoc, just because you keep mentioning beer. Do you have a favorite craft beer bar in Taipei then? Uh, yes, uh, Taihu for sure. The, the, the one in the, blue, in the blue can is, I apologize to my fellow, you know, the other people from Taiwan here, the only good uh, IPA in Taiwan, but it is actually quite good. So tonight is, I, 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 as I've gotten older, uh, you saw that picture of me when I was much thinner and much younger and had uh, all dark hair. Um, <laughs> I have, as I hit my 40s, had to give up, you know, not drinking nearly as much, except for Friday nights when I go to the grocery store and I buy some of that beer and I'm going to go get some tonight and I'm already looking forward to it. That might have been a nice softball question to end on. <laughs> 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 thank you so much, All right, Ben. Thank you. For I was going to drop the cliche, thank you, blah, 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 blah. But actually, I just want to reemphasize, that is truly the theme of my speech. It's why I'm here, why I wanted to come sort of speak. I don't like doing this that much anymore. I, I like the Q&A sort of thing. I'll sit in a chair and talk. But this project and this ecosystem has changed my life. So thank you. Ben, we also have a speaker gift for oh, you from you. the organizers. Thank you so much.